What's going on guys? My name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $650 and for that price you're getting a very powerful system. This video like the last few new part builds is going to be a full build guide. I'm not only going to be showing you each of the parts and why I picked them, but I'm also going to be showing you how to put everything together step by step. And finally I'm going to be showing you both gaming and streaming benchmarks because believe it or not the $650 PC is pretty good at streaming. Well, there are obviously tons of different ways you could have spent this budget, I went with parts that I know are quality, that'll work well together, and will last you a long time. If you're watching this video when it's first coming out, then you probably know that the PC part inventory is kind of crazy right now. For that reason, I'll be giving you a few different alternatives for some of the parts in this video, but if you're watching this in the future when the inventory is returned to normal, then lucky you. So let's kick things off by talking about the CPU. What I went with is the AMD Ryzen 3 31. 100. This is a quad core CPU with hyper threading that boosts up to 4 GHz. I got this for $105 and for that price it offers great gaming performance. It runs on AMD's latest Zen 2 architecture and is a great value for the money. If this isn't available or is way over MSRP, a good alternative is the Ryzen 5 1600 AF. This isn't going to be quite as good gaming performance wise, but for stuff like streaming and video editing this may be the better choice because it has two extra cores. This currently also comes in a little over $100 and again is a decent alternative. Both of these CPUs come with a Wraith Stealth cooler which comes free in the box and is what we'll be using to cool our CPU. This cooler works well and keeps things relatively cool and quiet. Moving on to the motherboard, this is probably the hardest hit part in terms of stock. What I went with for this build is the ASRock B450M Pro 4. This is my absolute favorite AM4 motherboard coming in normally at $75 but it's also a great pick because it has three other boards that offer very similar features and the exact same layout that would be good alternatives and would still allow you to follow this guide. These include the Pro 4F, the Pro 4 slash AC, and the Steel Legend. Again, all of these are B450M boards from ASRock and would work fine for this build. I really like the B450M Pro 4 because it has a ton of features like dual M.2 slots and 4 DIMM slots. It also has a decent VRM setup so if you decide to overclock in the future then you'll have that option. For RAM, I went with 16 gigabytes of XPG DDR4 RAM at 3200 megahertz. For $65 this is a really good value for the money and is a good option for pairing with budget Ryzen processors. 16 gigabytes is more than enough for gaming and is good enough for light streaming and video editing. Moving on to storage for this build I went with a single 500 gigabyte SSD from Silicon Power. This is a relatively basic SSD but it's still miles better than a hard drive. 500 gigabytes is a good amount of storage to start out with and should give you a while to save up to upgrade the storage in the future if you so choose. For the graphics card, I went with an NVIDIA GTX 1660 Super. This is the EVGA SC Ultra model and is a great 1080p graphics card. I really like this EVGA one because it looks cool in my opinion and has a backplate, but all of the 1660 Supers are going to perform similarly to one another, so if this one isn't in stock, I'll leave links to a few other 1660 Supers in the description below. To power this system, I went with the 500W Thermaltake Smart PSU. This is 80 plus certified and provides plenty of clean power to the entire system. It does have ketchup and mustard cables, but at $50 it's a good value for the money. Also, it's not modular, but that's not a big deal because the case we're using. To hold all these parts I went with the Thermaltake H18TG. For around $60 I like this case a lot. It has a full tempered glass side panel, a power supply basement, and plenty of room for easy cable management. One of my favorite features is the full front mesh panel which offers great airflow. This case was easy to work in and I have no troubles recommending it for your next budget build. It comes included with one fan at the back which is fine to start with but optionally you can add a cheap three pack of fans to the front like I did. These are green LED 120mm fans that were about $15 for the whole set. There are a number of different color options and you could always add RGB fans if you wanted to. I probably would have went with blue fans if I knew the front case LED was blue but I still think the blue and green looks pretty good together. All in all for around $650 the system is offering a lot of value for the money and it'll perform great in a number of different tasks. It also has a decent upgrade path with two free DIMM slots available and the option to upgrade all the way up to a Ryzen 9 CPU in the future. So now that you've learned about each of the parts and why I picked them, it's now time to show you how to put everything together. To assemble this system, the only tool you really need is a Phillips head screwdriver. I'd highly recommend you use a magnetic one because this will make the process easier in a number of ways. Other than that, you'll need an open area to work on and an afternoon set aside to put the system together and install all the software. 
In terms of static, there's not much to worry about, but if you live in a very dry place or are worried, you can always periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw or use one of these magnetic ground straps. With your table open, your schedule cleared, and your tools in hand, you are now ready to begin assembling your system. Start by getting out your motherboard box, open it up, and take out the SATA cables, the I.O. shield, the manual, and the motherboard itself. Take the board out of the bag and place it on top of the motherboard box. Now bring your attention to the CPU socket in the center of the board, push down and out on this metal lever and lift it up until it's perpendicular with the board. Now get out your CPU, handling it only by the edges. You can line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard, but I like to line the Ryzen 3 3100 text with the top of the socket that says socket AM4. Once lined up, lower it into place applying no pressure, it should just slip in. Then go ahead and lower the lever arm back down making sure it clips into place. The next order of business is installing our cooler, but we first need to remove these two pieces of plastic. You simply unscrew two screws on each and then lift them away. Now you can get out your CPU cooler that also came in the CPU box. Flipping it over you can see there's thermal paste pre-applied so there's no reason to add our own. Lower the cooler onto the socket with the AMD logo either facing the RAM slots or the I.O. and lining the screws up with the posts. Once down you can do a few turns at a time on each screw going in a cross pattern until tightened down all the way. This is to ensure we're applying even pressure across the CPU. The next part is optional but if you want the AMD logo facing up, then remove the four screws that are slightly above the ones we just tightened down. Once all four are out, you can simply lift up the fan and rotate it 90 degrees, then all you have to do is reinstall the four screws. Next, locate CPU fan header 1 to the top right of the cooler. Take the fan cable and line the notch in the connector with the notch in the header and press it into place. Next, you can take the fan cable and hide it under the fan shroud to neaten things up a bit. With that done, we can now turn our attention to the RAM slots next to the cooler. Go ahead and open up the clips on slot 2 and 4. Take your first stick of RAM and orient it so the notch in the slot lines up with the notch on the RAM stick itself. Slot it into place and when you are sure it's in, press down on both ends until you hear a clicking noise and the clip snap shut. With that done, we can set the motherboard aside and bring our attention to the case. Instead of lifting the case out of the box, flip it upside down and lift the box away. Then once the case is out, start by removing the two thumb screws for the back panel. You may need to use a screwdriver because these come pretty tight from the factory. Then once both are removed, simply pull the tab to release the panel and lift it away. Now with the case on its side, remove the four thumb screws and make sure to put these all in a safe place for later. You can now lift the glass panel away. I recommend putting both of these panels in the case box for now because it gets them out of the way and prevents them from getting damaged. Now untie this bundle at the back of the case which is holding the front connectors and this bag which contains all the screws necessary to build the system. Now to remove the front panel all you have to do is pull from the bottom of it to pop it out. This does take a fair bit of force but don't worry you aren't going to break anything. Once released pull it away fishing the wires from this hole. You can next put the system on its side and pull out your IO shield we took out of the motherboard box earlier. Orient it like this, lower it into place and pop each corner in one at a time until it's secure. Before we put in our motherboard, we need to install two extra standoffs that came from the screw bag and look like this. These are going to go here and here. Just tighten these down by hand one at a time. The last one wasn't going in by hand, so I used a motherboard screw all the way in to help rotate it into place, then took the screw out. Now handling the board by its core, lower it in I.O. side first, then hinge it down, lining up the I.O. with the I.O. shield, and making sure you can see the standoffs through each of the holes. Now get out the eight motherboard screws that look like this, and put one in each of the holes in the motherboard. This is every hole except for the bottom right one that doesn't have a corresponding standoff. If you got the extra fans, it's now time to install them. Get them out of the box and unbundle each fan cable. You're going to put all three in the front just like this. Also, make sure to orient the up here text on the back of the fans facing up. Use these screws that came with the fans to install them. Line each fan up with the center screw holes and put four screws into each. Once secure, route the top fan cable through this hole here and the bottom two through this bottom opening. Get the front panel you took off earlier and refish the wires back through the holes that they came from, then pop the panel back into place. With this done, now get out your SSD and the little bag that says 2.5 inch SSD from the screw bag. Place three of these rubber pieces like this on the SSD, then use three screws to attach them. Set the rubber pieces through these big holes and then slide it to the side to lock it into place. Take your power supply out of the box and undo the bundle of wires. Take the power supply and flip it so the fan is facing down and push it to the back of the case opening like this. Get out the four power supply screws that look like this and put one in each of the corresponding holes in the power supply until it's secured into place. 
With that done, we are now ready to start routing and plugging in cables. Start by grabbing the 24 pin PSU cable that looks like this and routing it through this hole here. Take the 8 pin CPU cable that looks like this and route it up through this hole here. Next, take the dual 6 plus 2 GPU cable and push it through this hole here. For the case cables, take the USB 3 that looks like this and route it through here. Take the block that says HD audio and route it through this hole here. Take the connector that says USB and route it through this hole here. And finally, take the three small front panel cables that look like this and route them through the same hole that you put the USB 2 connector in. Now carefully set the case on its side. Let's start by plugging in the power supply cables. Grab the 24 pin cable and line the notch in the cable with the notch in the connector and press it into place until it clips in. Here's a better angle of it so you can get a better idea of what I'm talking about. Now grab your 8 pin CPU cable and line the notch in it with the notch in the header and press it into place. Again here's another angle of it. We don't do anything with the GPU cable just yet so turn your attention to the other connectors. Find the HD audio header on the bottom left of the board and plug in the HD audio connector with the HD audio text facing up. Next grab the USB 2 connector and plug it into one of the two USB headers with the USB text facing down. Now bring your attention to the front panel header at the bottom right. Take the power switch cable and plug it into the two top right pins like this. Orientation doesn't matter. Next take the reset switch cable and plug it directly below the power button. Again orientation doesn't matter. And finally for the hard drive LED you plug that into the left of the reset switch making sure the text is facing down and the plus sign is facing to the left. Because this is for an LED and not for a switch orientation does matter in this case. You can also always refer to page 27 of the manual which has the pinout clearly shown in a diagram. Next take the 3 pin fan connector from the back fan and plug it into the closest fan header which is just to the right of it. Now that everything in the front is plugged in, we can now plug a few things in at the back. Grab the Molex cable from the power supply that looks like this, the three fan cables, and the case LED cable. Plug each of these into the Molex PSU cables. One needs to be daisy chained because there are four cables but only three connectors. You just plug the three in, then take the extra one and plug it into the end of one of the other three like this. Now grab a SATA power cable from the PSU and plug it into the SSD like this, making sure the notch in the connector and cable line up. Now take a SATA cable we pulled from the motherboard box and plug one end into the SSD with the clip facing up. Route this to the front of the case and plug it into one of the four SATA cables again with the clip facing up. With this done we can now install our graphics card. With the case on its side remove the middle two screws on the back of the case and lift the two covers away. Unscrew this sliding cover, slide it up then secure it down. On the PCIe slot itself open up the locking clip like this. Take your graphics card and line up the notch in the PCIe slot with the notch in the card itself. Lower it down and once you're sure it's in you can press it into place. Slide the cover back down and reinstall one or both of the screws you took out earlier. Finally take the PCIe power cable and line up both the notches and press it into place. With that done you've successfully installed everything. To cable manage the system just pull all the excess wires to the back and secure things down with the included zip ties. This cable has a big power supply basement so you can just push the excess Access cables down there and won't need to put too much effort or time into cable management unless you want to. With that done, you can now reinstall the back panel and glass panel the way you took them off, but make sure to remove the plastic on both sides of the glass panel. With that done, your PC is successfully assembled, but there is a number of things we need to do until you'll be ready to jump into games. The first thing is you need to install Windows. I'm not going to get into how to do that in this video, but it's relatively simple and straightforward, and I'll have a link to a video tutorial on it in the description below. Next thing you need to do is with the system shut off, hit the power button, then immediately press the delete key repeatedly until you enter into the BIOS. Tab over to this page, then go down and enable the XMP profile, which will allow our RAM to run at the full rated speed. With that done, go over to the save tab and select save changes and exit. Once this is done, the last thing you need to do is install some drivers. First are the motherboard drivers. Head over to the website for your specific motherboard. If you opted for one of the alternative motherboards, then just search its name and click on the page for it that's on the ASRock website. Click support, then download, and download the AMD all-in-one driver. 
Once downloaded, open it up and install it. With that done, you need to get graphics drivers. Head to the link in the description and select GeForce 16 series, then 1660 Super and hit search. This will give you the latest graphics drivers for your card and you just have to download these and install them. With this done, you're ready to start playing some games. Hopefully that guide was helpful to some of you who are wanting to build this system. For gaming, I tested 6 games. These include Valorant, Fortnite, Borderlands 3, CSGO, Rainbow Six, and Doom Eternal. Starting out with Valorant, this is a new popular esports game. I tested it at 1080p max settings. At these settings, the system stayed around the 200 FPS mark most of the time. This was my first time playing Valorant and honestly I really enjoyed it. Moving on to Rainbow Six, I tested this game at 1080p high settings and used the built-in benchmarking tool. At these settings, the system averaged 207 FPS. I like this built-in benchmark because it's super repeatable, but if you'd prefer seeing in-game performance, let me know. Moving on to Fortnite, I tested the system at 1080p Pro settings. With these settings, the system stayed in the upper 100s most of the time. This was a pretty smooth experience and well above the 144 FPS mark necessary for competitive play. In CSGO, the system was tested at 1080p Pro settings, which is basically everything set to low. In this game, the system averaged right around 300 FPS. This was a great experience, but the system is very overkill for a game like CSGO. Next, let's talk about the two AAA games that I tested. Starting out with Doom Eternal, I tested this at 1080p high settings. With these settings, the system stayed right around the 110 to 120 FPS mark most of the time. This was a good experience and shows that AAA 1080p gaming for this system works well. Finally, I tested Borderlands 3 at 1080p medium using the built-in benchmark. Doing this offered a 94 FPS average which is a pretty good result considering how hard to run this game is. Now let's go ahead and talk about streaming. This setup isn't the best for streaming and if you're wanting to stream a lot then I'd recommend going for the alternative CPU which is the 1600 AF. This will still be pretty good gaming performance wise and will receive better streaming performance. With that being said I tested this Ryzen 3 system streaming both Valorant and Fortnite to Twitch. I streamed at 720p 60fps and here are the other settings I went with on screen. I found that with these settings both Valorant and Fortnite streamed fine. This was a pretty big basic stream with just gameplay and a face cam, but overall I'm pretty happy with how well this system streams. So as you can see, the system performs well in both gaming and streaming. I'm really happy with how the system turned out and hope this video was helpful for some of you out there or at least entertaining. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.